<laughs> Australian sailfish um, and, and its history and also about hopefully the emerging, emerging classic dinghy scene in Australia. Um, so thank you, over to you, Greg. All right, well, good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming along. Um, the first thing I've got to say is that it does seem a bit odd to be talking to a group whose primary focus is raid sailing about the Australian sailfish, because it's not really a raid boat. <laughs> Although I've got a mate in Sydney who is keen to say, oh, no, if you just get lightweight gear, you can go and you can do an overnight camp. And it's like, yeah, really? Really? Because it is a glorified sailing board. Um, and I'd also like to thank Mick Storer for suggesting the talk and uh, to Kim for organising it. So I made some notes about this just to get my, my thoughts in some sort of structure. Uh, and this is really a story in two parts, because it's a story about the Australian sailfish, but it's also a story about Jack Carroll, um, who with his very good mate, Bruce Scott, created the Australian sailfish. So if I jump back and forward between the two, I hope you'll forgive me. And, um, but basically what happened was that Jack was born in working class Bayside suburbs down here in Melbourne in 1929. And as the war ended, so mid forties, he started to sail. Um, basically, mostly things like Vaucluse Seniors and the heavyweight Sharpies uh, from clubs around the Eastern side of the bay. So we had um, Parkdale, Mordialic, Chelsea, North Road, which is defunct now, and up through to Elwood, which is up near Lake uh, Albert Park Lake. Um, and it was here that he met the guy that became a very good friend, Bruce Scott. Um, but by the early 1950s, they were both lamenting the difficulty of getting themselves regular crews. So at the time, Jack was working as a floor finisher. Um, it's an amazing thought because he's only a little bloke, um, but you know, with the big floor sanders. Um, and uh, so, one weekend, he was there, Bruce came round, he had an American sailing magazine that had um, an Alcourt sailfish, which is the, the Latine rig, pointy bow, quite heavy as so many North American and European boats are. And he threw the magazine down in front of Jack and he said, that's what we want, we won't have to deal with crew anymore. <laughs> so Jack said, I know what we'll do. He was sanding the floor in a school. So they went down on the weekend and they drew up the sailfish on the floor of the school. So they drew a plan, they drew a side view, and they said, we want a scow because it's for the bay. A skiff will be uh, get too, basically too buried because if you've not sailed on the bay, the bay is wide but shallow. So you get very steep, sharp waves through it. And uh, so they drew that up on the floor and they said, yep, yeah, that's about right. They took the measurements and that's the boat, that's the sailfish. Um, and it was like no study groups, no customer research. They literally drew it up in chalk on the floor of, of school one weekend. And so the original plan was they just wanted boats for themselves to sail. So they built two. Number one was Little Osprey because Bruce Scott's boats had all been called Osprey. So sailfish, Little Osprey. And number two was Debonair, which was Jack's. And uh, took them down, launched them, and immediately they started to draw attention. And uh, they were there one day rigging up. And one of the, somebody walked up and said, what's that? What sort of boat's that down at Parkdale? And Bruce turned around very quick and said, it's an Australian sailfish. And that's where the name came from. Nobody had put a name to it at that point. It was just, they were building boats to sail. So there'd been no thought of starting a new class. They just wanted a boat each. It was just a way for them to get out on the water. But people started to go, can you build me one? And so Jack and Bruce, basically went from people's house. The first eight boats were built with no plans. 
So it was just Jack and Bruce going around to people's houses on the weekend or in the evening and saying, well, it's got to be this measurement here. And then Bruce decided he better draw up a set of plans and building instructions. Once that happened and word got out around the bay, the class really started to take off. And um, I don't know the background of, of any of you in terms of sailing and where you've sailed, but to the two biggest clubs down here were Parkdale and Elwood. And they were commonly getting up to 30 sailfish at each club each weekend, which is like, you look at that nowadays and think, what? Um, but that popularity pushed them and the people getting involved because, you know, you've got 30, 40, 50, 60 people all of a sudden. They formed an association in 1962, but it was still really based on the bay. And then um, Ken Curran Sailing Club, which is up near Malden Castle Main area in the middle of Victoria, uh, the Goldfields area, decided that they needed a boat to attract younger sailors. Um, and they looked around and they picked the sailfish and they started to work at getting young guys building their boats and getting on the water. And then there was an article, an Australian sailing. Uh, there's a couple of articles if any of you look at the old magazines, there's one of Debonair, number two with the top hat and cane on the sail um, that uh, was on the cover. And once that happened, word began to spread. And all of a sudden, uh, a guy called Colin Guy in Queensland got in touch, established a class in Queensland. And it really took off. They formed an association. And then Papua New Guinea, and they had a couple of big places for fleets, uh, one of which was Rabaul, which routinely had 20 boats. But I'm not sure how many of those might have been just built from the one set of plans. <laughs> you know, it's like once you got one, it's like, oh, I'll just, yeah, I'll just use that. Um, so in 1967, with an association active in Queensland, in New Guinea, and of course here in Melbourne, um, a few guys in Sydney that had built them said, well, we might form an association. So they got together, um, Beresford Blewett, uh, Ben Castle, a few other people up all around the Narrabeen, Greater Northern Beaches area. And uh, they looked at a couple of clubs and those clubs were like, oh, not really interested. And they found that the Narrabeen Lake Sailing Club was basically mothballed. It still had an account, it still had a treasurer, there was no sailing. And so they contacted the treasurer and they basically re-established the club. Um, and that became the home base for the sailfish in New South Wales. And then around 1970, Murray Bailey founded the Nepean Sailfish Sailing Club and it sailed on the Nepean River at Penrith between the old highway bridge and the new freeway bridge. And it's a monstrous place to sail. I've sailed there a few times. And uh, the banks are higher than the top of the sailfish mast. So you really are at the whim of the current and whatever breeze happens to be able to get down onto the riverbed. It's hard work. And then in the 70s, um, a couple of guys up on Lake Macquarie at Toronto got involved and really pushed the class up there as well. So, from all of that, we had our first national titles, which was held at Elwood on Port Phillip. And I think at that stage, the Port Phillip guys thought that it was theirs. It was just a matter of who was going to win it. Um, as it turns out, one of the young blokes from Cairn Curran, a guy called Lee Marriott, won. Uh, and another young bloke who'd come down from Narrabeen and was actually boarding with the Carroll family uh, Peter Chapman was a close second and in fact wouldn't have, would, he, sorry, he would have won, but he got knocked out of one race because he was over the line at the start. And those were the days when the sailing rules were, you're out. There's no coming back and going around the boat, you're out. So Jack competed in those titles and Bruce ran them. Um, and Bruce kept these extraordinarily meticulous records, which Jack gave me a couple of years ago um, so that anybody who was going to be organising a title later 
would be able to look at this and say, this is what we do, this is how we do it. And from that point on, the national titles alternated one year in Victoria, the next year in New South Wales, until the last titles were held uh, 1987, 88 here in Victoria. I think that um, the big factors that made the class so popular, I think really still have a lot going for them now, um, especially with the resurgence in interest, pardon me, in uh, classic boats and classic wooden boats. It's a strict one design, changes are minimal, changes are gradual, it took us from 1962 to 1982 to adopt that radical piece of equipment, the adjustable boom thing. Uh, so it really, really was very small incremental steps. They're very straightforward to build. Um, and in fact, after we launched the website in 2016, Chris Cleary, my partner in crime in all this, rewrote um, the building instructions and in fact he built a boat as he went along to make sure that the building instructions and the boat building went together uh, so he's got that as his second sailfish at the moment um, part of that strict one design ethos was very strict minimum weight 63 pounds that's 27 point something kilos i think um, and the the setup where you've got uh, a keel cross frames um, stringers, timber sides, and a deck plank gave you a very strong, um, lightweight, small boat that lasted. Um, the oldest boat that we know of is, of course, Jack Stebonair, number two, built in 1956. But just recently, number 48 surfaced. And in fact, it's just got a new home. It's off to Launceston next month for a full restore. Um, the boat is portable, as uh, if any of you are familiar with it or you've seen photos, you know, it's, um, I mean, I've always thought it's a two-man lift, but I've seen old video footage of people putting their hand through the centreboard case and carrying them around, which I, I'm not big enough or strong enough to do. Um, but it meant that it's easy to get into the water, it's easy to get an on, on and off a trailer or roof racks. Um, but the other thing which I think really contributed to uh, a lot of boats surviving is that because it's so small, people just stored them anywhere. So underneath your house, up in the rafters of the carport or the garage, they just disappear. Whereas if it's a heron or a mirror, that's a car space gone. And so people would tend to say, no, we can't keep the old boat anymore, it's got to go. Um, just after we launched the website, we took a weekend away down at uh, Sorrento around the bay. And we walked into a secondhand furniture place, which was a converted warehouse. And apropos of absolutely nothing, I looked up and there's a sailfish upside down in the rafters, probably 12, 15 feet off the ground. So they really are everywhere, aren't they? And we've had um, boats turning up all over the place. I went down to Geelong, to an antique store in North Geelong. Uh, and I walked in and I looked and all I could see was the back two feet and dial, D-I-L-E. And there was an iconic boat in the class in the late seventies, early eighties, Stanley Crocodile. And this, this guy in this antique store had been using the hull as a table for 30 years. So I just went, uh, that's coming home. So I've done a full restore on Stanley. Stanley Crocodile is back, back out and sailing. Um, they are still relatively inexpensive boats. Um, I paid $200 for the bare hull for Stanley. I, people are buying secondhand ones for at, at the top end, 450 bucks. Uh, you can build a brand new one and get on the water for under $3,000 roughly depending on you know, how fussy you are. Most of us have got bags of bits of boats and timber, so we don't have to buy all the fittings. And um, the other thing I think that made them popular was the scow design, that flat design. 
really suited Port Phillip and they kicked up onto a plane very easily. Uh, one of my first times when I moved down here, I went up to Cairn Curran. This was in the early 80s when I first, the first time I moved down here and uh, went up to Cairn Curran. It was blowing and I was helping run the, uh, the afternoon race. And one of the guys on the sailfish came around the bottom mark and on the reach went past a fireball with its kite up. And he had it absolutely flat, but it was howling. It was really blowing. So they really go. Um, I mentioned construction before. It's as simple as you can get. All you need is a straight and level builder's plank. Get that set up so it's absolutely square. Put the deck plank down onto that. Fit six frames down the length of the deck plank and the, the spacings are all in the plans. Then you just turn around and um, screw the keel on to the frames, put the stringers on, put the sides on, put the bottom ply on, turn it over. And really you're looking at your final fit out for things like foot straps and travelers. And then the deck goes on and you're most of the way there. Uh, as we no doubt saw with um, a lot of classes in the late 80s, numbers faded and there's been a few people I know that have had heated discussions as to why this was. Change of focus by Yachting Australia, um, people wanting instant boats rather than having to build one themselves, seeing that as a negative rather than a positive. But I guess in the end, the why, well, I think the why, it doesn't matter so much. It's, it's just what happened. It's like what happens now. Um, a lot of us held on to boats. I parted with one particular, does anybody know Bruce Keir, quite a famous builder of fireballs and a few other boats down here in Melbourne, uh, renowned boat builder. Uh, I owned one of his sailfish that I'd bought from someone else uh, and let it go, which I still regret. And uh, I chased down a boat about 2014 and was in touch with uh, Chris. We talked sailfish, you know, occasionally we think about going for a sail. But there were a few of us that just kept the flame going, as it were, with the sailfish, just keeping the the memory of the class alive. It had, it had died out. Um, then in January 2016, a few of us looking at sailing uh, things online saw that a guy called Andrew Chapman in Inverloch had sailed Jack's original sailfish, number two, Debonair, at the Inverloch Classic Wooden Dinghy Regatta that year. Um, and Andrew had picked this boat up. It was a deceased estate. If he hadn't got it, it was going to the tip. And he's done an absolutely fantastic restoration job. So this got a few of us going, oh, oh Inverloch Classic Wooden Dinghy Regatta. So we sort of thought, yeah, caught up with a few people we had talked to for a few decades and said, maybe we should go along. So middle of that year, 2016, one of these people that I'd caught up with who lives out in the Western Districts in Victoria, he was in Melbourne, we had lunch, talked sailfish, and he said, it's a pity there isn't a website. And I, I look back later and I think he was just planting the seed really, wasn't he? Because uh, I stopped over, I'd been up to visit family up in New South Wales, coming back, stayed with Chris Cleary, and we got to talking and uh, the class co-founder, Jack Carroll, still alive at the time, he said, we need to talk to Jack. Because, you know, when you're young and you're fiery and all that history stuff about the class, it's unimportant. Who cares about that? It's like, let's go sailing. And uh, now that we've become old farts extraordinarily, it's like, no, no, this is important. We need to go and talk to Jack. So Jack was living in Bendigo and uh, Chris came down. I went up from Melbourne and we spent the day going back over all the background stuff that we hadn't known about. And uh, Chris and I came away from that day knowing a hell of a lot more about the start of the class. And we said, maybe it's time for a website. 
So we launched it in October 2016. And on that website, we really heavily promoted that we were going to go to the 2017 Inverloch Classic Wooden Dinghy Regatta. And uh, the most, because this was middle October and you're talking about an event on Australia Day, people came out of the woodwork. It was like, I'll be there, I'll be there, I'll be there. And so we had 11 people who said that they would be there with their boats. Uh, this was a class that had been dead since 1988. And uh, I said to Chris, it's like, well, you know, if 11 of them say they'll turn up, if eight turn up, we will have done really well. All 11 turned up, which blew us away. But then we came in from the regatta race and there were 15 more old sailfish sailors up on the on the boardwalk watching what had happened that didn't have boats anymore. The following year we had 2018, we had 13. 2019, we had 20 sailfish. So every year that we've been at Inverloch, we've been the biggest class. Um, extraordinarily, having 20 there in 2019 wasn't the big deal. The big deal was that uh, just a couple of weeks short of his 90th birthday, Jack went out and sailed his original sailfish on Debonair, uh, on Debonair on Anderson's Inlet. And uh, Jack died in August, This the, the August just gone. And the guy that was running it said, 90 year olds just don't do that. But nobody had thought to tell Jack. So he took off, went off the beach, he tacked, went down, tacked, came back up along the beach and the sailfish. And I looked at it, I thought, he's gonna jibe. So jibed into the beach, that'll do. And we didn't know it at the time, but that was actually his last sail. So the sailfish revival is continuing. Um, the global pandemic, funnily enough, has created problems. Um, so that's interfered with it a bit. We've got old boats that keep turning up. Uh, as I said, I've got Stanley Crocodile, um, another two boats that were iconic boats out of um, uh, Narrabeen have turned up in the last 12 months. Uh, the first fiberglass hull sailfish in New South Wales has turned up, but it's being used as a, a ceiling decoration in a fish and chip shop somewhere near Buller Dealer and the guy won't part with it. So what do you do? Um, but the interesting thing is that there are new boats being built. Jack's, Jack Carroll's son, Brian, who's a sailmaker in Painesville, um, when I first contacted him and said, we're gonna set up the website, but I want you and your sister to be happy that we're doing this because it's part of your heritage. And uh, Brian moved from, what are you bothering to do that for? To borrowing a boat to be in there in 2017, to building a new boat in 2018. Um, so that's all going off. The thing that's really knocked me out, we have had boats built in uh, Brazil. Uh, we've had boats built in Germany, Italy. I've just had a guy build one in his apartment in Germany and third floor apartment. And I said, how, how did you get it out? He said, it took four of us and quite some time, but, <laughs> but we got it out. So he's been sailing. Um, in America, we've had a couple of boats uh, built. Uh, we've had one guy sailing his on the Great Lakes. I recently sent a plan to a guy in Alaska. I think the, the sailing season in Alaska for a sailfish is going to be like between about 11 a.m. and 1 p.m. on the 24th of June. Uh, I certainly don't know that I'd want to sail, but the interest people just want a nice, easy, light built. So that's that's the sailfish, um, and it's it's still going on. People are still interested. It's great, but this is also a bit about about Jack. Uh, Jack Carroll, as I say, started the class with his good mate Bruce. He attended every national and Victorian state title, originally as a competitor. And then later on, he just turned up to look after what he called his funny little boat. And the thing with Jack was that 
he was always ready and happy to answer a question or to give advice um, or just pretty well have a chat about sailing, anything at all. Uh, what sticks in my mind with Jack, particularly because as a youngster at Maraboon, he was just Jack. Oh, yeah, he designed the boat. But that was all. But he'd never tell you what to do. He'd never say, that's wrong. You need to do this. But he might walk over, have a look up and down your boat. He might look over and catch your eye and you'd see him. And, uh, at one of my sailing mates, Ian, up in Maraboon, and I'd forgotten this part, but he'd look and he'd do this, this little crook of the finger. What have you done that like that for, he'd say. He's trying to trigger a conversation, trying to get thought processes going. Um, and all the time it was like, interested, why? Why have you done this? Why have you done that? You know, what's the thinking behind it? And again, triggering people to think about their actions, to think about what was going on. And so Jack... In 1962, when they formed the association, he became the class association secretary and he became the plan sales supervisor. And these were roles that, and measurer, sorry, and these were roles that he held for many years. Um, he was always interested in what people did, why they did it and how they did it. Um, when the Queensland Association started in the early mid 60s, Jack loaded the family up with a boat. They went north. They sailed at Sandgate. They helped to promote the class. When the New South Wales Association was formed, Jack and a couple of mates would more than once drive up for the weekend. So if you can think south southeastern suburbs, Melbourne, on the old Hume Highway, when you used to go through every town, that's the four of them would drive up with a trailer with boats on the back. That sailed Saturday, that sailed Sunday. They'd drive home Sunday night and be at work Monday morning. It's like you had to be young and fiery. It'd kill me now. Um, but he was always there, always um, happy to promote, to do anything he could to help the boat along. Jack eventually gave up floor sanding as a living, as you do as you get older. Um, and he got a job as a warehouse manager with FICO. And then when that was absorbed by Ronston, he moved over to Ronston. And he tells this wonderful story that on his first day there, at the end of the day, there's, you know, there might be block hangers, there might be shackle pins, there might be shackle bodies, bits and pieces on the floor. And the people are just sweeping the floor down and putting them, you know, in the bin. And Jack said he was down on his hands and knees picking bits out of the piles of rubbish. Because <laughs> it was like, oh, no, no, that's good. good. So... When Jack retired, he and his wife, Evelyn, moved from Bayside, Melbourne, up to Bendigo. Uh, and again, if you don't know the area, central goldfield sort of Melbourne. And Lake Epilock is uh, to the east of Melbourne. And he'd been an active member at Bendigo Yacht Club for some years. And most weekends, he and Ev would leave Melbourne, go up with a caravan on the back and a boat on the roof, come back Sunday afternoon. But one of the things he noticed when he settled up in Bendigo was that there wasn't a junior sailing program. So he started one. And uh, using Northbridge Juniors, he started to train the young kids that turned up. And that training program produced quite a few successful skippers who went on to win national and world titles. Uh, the Good Alls, if you know of Good Alls, depending on your sailing background, sail makers in Bendigo now, they've won A class world titles, went through Bendigo. Um, but perhaps the best known of them is uh, a young kid called Glenn Ashby. Uh, Glenn was the skipper of the winner of the last America's Cup held in Auckland, which is not bad for a country kid who learned to sail on a Northbridge Junior in a country sailing club. So after the association folded in the late 80s, Jack collected the remaining sailfish plans, the plan sales books, and he took them home and he just kept them. Uh, once we got the website up and running and we were starting to put plans out, um, he knew he had to move out of the home and move into to care. 
and uh, he said to Brian, all the sailfish stuff goes to Greg. So I have all sorts of fascinating sailfish memorabilia that I can bore you to death with, should you so wish. Um, the thing that stands out for me though, was because I've lived in both states, in New South Wales, Jack was Jack Carroll, oh yeah, he co-designed the sailfish, lovely bloke, very helpful, always friendly, always a smile. But in Victoria, it was something else. Um, it was really quite a surprise uh, to find out the respect that Jack was held in all around the Bay, all around Victoria, in all sorts of different classes. And in fact, after he stopped sailing sailfish, he went on to win master's titles in uh, sabres as well. Um, I think uh, the thing that was really interesting to me was that in 2018, uh, one of my friends in Sydney started the, the ball rolling, or 2017, he started the ball rolling to nominate Jack for an order of Australia for services to sailing, particularly to training young sailors. Um, Supporting statements came from a few big names, including Glenn Ashby and the Ronston CEO, Arthur Murray, who are both all uh, recipients of uh, Order of Australia awards. The funny thing down here too is uh, the respect that Frank was held in, uh, that Jack was held in, I'm sorry. Um, Frank Hammond, the sailmaker, who in fact employed Jack's son as an apprentice, said at uh, Brian's 60th birthday that he turned up at a YA function here in Melbourne in the early 70s and he saw that they'd sat me with uh, he'd sat been sat with Jack and Evelyn Carroll and he said I thought I'd made it I thought I was sitting with royalty Jack would have been astonished if he'd known that he just he was just such this humble little guy um, the fascinating thing that at his funeral uh, a lot of people that hadn't seen him, some of them in decades, made the trip up to Bendigo. Uh, and those that couldn't sent messages, and that included both John and Lex Bertrand and Glenn Ashby, which gives an indication of, of how Jack was seen. And all of this is a background, I think, to what's happening in the classic dinghy movement down here. Um, the schedule's actually starting to get crowded. Um, Inverloch is a big deal. Uh, there's now the Cairn Curran Classic, which is held in November. Um, boats like Gwen Twelves, again, another class like the sailfish that were all but extinct. Uh, there are some stunning restorations of Gwen Twelves starting to turn up and some really exciting competitive sailing with them. The moths, of course, have their connection back to Inverloch because that's where the Inverloch 11 footer came from that became the moth, the international moth. Uh, the scow moth, which was almost extinct, um, has now got themselves to the point where the International Moth Class Association has asked them as a group to become an affiliate of the, uh, the ICMA. So um, there's a lot of interest in wooden boats. It's really good to see. That's really what I've got. Uh, if you have questions, I'll try to answer them. Um, so over to you. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Greg. Um, I guess I'll start. So I guess most of us here, actually probably all of us in the call at the moment, have all sailed Nero's or Herons or that sort of generation of, of, of wooden boat. Um, so, so what, obviously the, the sailfish is in the same category. So what, what do you think is the future for these sort of old ply, sort of small off the beach dinghies? Is, you know, are, are you seeing that people, like, like probably we are, people are pulling them out of sheds or buying them cheap and restoring them. Is there a comeback happening or is it only just like a last gasp? <laughs> what, what do you think? I think at the moment there's a comeback. I don't know how long it will last. Um, after Inverloch <coughs> 2017, people were running around saying, we must reform the association, we must reform the association. And I went, hang on, hang on. It's like, we're all in our 60s. Some of us in our late 60s. If the association's to be reformed, 
it's got to have young blood. It's got to have, mm. it's got to en engage people probably in their 20s that have got the energy and the input to do all this. I mean, Jack and Bruce were in their late 20s when they designed it. That's, that's the sort of voof you need to, to really have it happen. I hope it's not a last gasp. There's some beautiful boats out there. There's, um, there's yeah. Uh, if any of you raced um, herons, you might have known Murray Bailey or known of Murray Bailey uh, up in Sydney. He sailed out from near the Spit. What was the sailing club there? But a very keen heron sailor back in the 70s. Um, I hope it's not a last gasp. I hope that it will engage people, that people will be stepping away from, I want an instant boat, to understanding that the incredible pleasure you get from either restoring an old boat or building a new one out of timber. Having said that, whilst I appreciate how good epoxy is, I hate working with epoxy. It's so messy. <laughs> but it's a huge step forward on the glues that we had, not mentioning resource and all. <laughs> but yeah, I, I hope I hope mm -hmm. it's a resurgence. Okay. Uh, any other questions for Greg? Um, yeah, I'm not familiar with the sailfish. I was thinking it was the the uh, gaff rig style fiberglass little number. Um, oh no, no. Sure no. Well, so <laughs> I, will, I will talk so in the dimensions. All right, I'll talk in non-metric because that's what I grew up with. Um, the hull is 11 foot six long. It's scale, as I mentioned. It's three foot wide at the widest beam. The bare hull is nine inches deep, so it's fully decked. Um, the closest thing these days would be a scale-shaped uh, stand-up paddleboard in, in terms of just the hull shape. It has um, a Bermudan rig, 65 square foot sail. Uh, there's a cadet rig, which is a Sabo sail. Um, it has a three foot long centerboard. Pardon me again. Um, yeah. If you want to have a look, uh, there's a website. So if you've got a pen handy and you want to note it down, it's australiansailfish.wordpress.com. But if you Google Australian sailfish dinghy, it'll come up pretty high up. Yeah, I'll do that after I get yeah. off and have a... <laughs> what is I said to I somebody, ever... I said, you, um, they said, oh, you know, that's something about the sailfish. And I said, no, no, no. I said, you can never leave the cult. <laughs> like once, once it's in your blood, you're in your blood. Okay. Having, having learnt my sailing on a sailfish, um, I know a few of you sail herons or modified herons, and I've had the most amazing sailing, racing sailing ever in a heron at a New South Wales state titles where we had 94 starters. <laughs> yeah, I'm never going to repeat that. That's uh, to go out in a fleet all trying to get to the good point on the starting line and there's 94 boats was a bit mind boggling. <laughs> any others for any others? Yeah, so I liked your observation that, that the boats survived because they were small enough to get tucked away into, yeah. into unlikely places. I, I guess the other thing is it's car toppable, isn't it? It's sort of man portable. You can put yeah. it on a roof rack, you can drive somewhere. And um, I guess that's something else that we're hearing from people that, that, you know, these days people don't have a spare carport anymore. There's no garage for dad to build a boat in or to keep the boat in. People living in apartments. Um, yeah, most much. people's car spaces are actually also storage as well because they can't afford an extra bedroom. Yeah. Um, is is there is there a need for something modern like that? Maybe that, or, or is is the selfish actually still the thing? Oh, something modern like that. Probably something modern like that's probably going to cost fifteen thousand dollars, isn't it? Mm. <laughs> Which is, you know, a bit of an eye-watering amount of money for somebody that <clears throat> might decide it's not for them. Um, yeah, something modern like that would be good. Um, the, the boats that are being built, the sailfish that are being built overseas, uh, and I'm thinking of this, this latest one, this German one that was built in a flat. 
and it, it was a piece of art. It could have been a wall hanging. Um, I would love to see something equivalent. Again, um, I'm thinking of things like there's uh, Jim French, an ex free sailor, has got the Skeeter um, and the Nicky, um, which are uh, foiling scales. Oh, yeah. Yep, I've seen um, that. Yep. And uh, <laughs> they're up around ba um, Bayview, Byra, Avalon Sailing, or Avalon Yacht Club, pardon me. Um, quite often, I think, Ian Ward's up around that area. Uh, and they're, they're close, but again, it's a lot of money. Um, the Nikki, I think, is the closest <laughs> thing to a foiling sailfish. The, the dimensions and everything else, just with wings thrown on because it foils. But yeah, uh, it would be nice to see something that's not an opti or a bic <laughs> that uh, cost a lot of money and then seem to be discarded fairly quickly. And I guess the other question then is, um, uh, what are the cruising possibilities <laughs> in, in a sailfish? Well, as I said, my mate Ian um, <coughs> is very keen. He uh, wants to cruise the Mile Lakes on his sailfish, one of his sailfish. Uh, I, <coughs> boy, you're going to need good waterproofing. Mm. Of on a flat on a flat piece of water, you're going to get water across the deck. That's all there is. And once a chop comes up, you get a bit of one of those lovely east coast nor'easters coming in. You're belting up Mile Lakes with that on your your uh, starboard bow. You'll be you'll know. It's like it's wet. Uh, cruising. Uh, Chris, who's helping me build the um, Fiola, or probably he's building the Fiola and I'm helping him. Um, he has a Bay Raider. And I keep saying to him that we need the Bay Raider as the mothership to be able to do cruises. So we can load all our gear in that mm -hmm. and have three or four sailfish mm -hmm. and then just swap, swap turns of who's on which boat. Mm -hmm. So um, Ian thinks yes, I think no in answer to your question. Oh, well, so if, he, if, he's, um, if he is doing it on the mile legs, let us know. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Come I'll along and either, either watch or provide, um, provide safety cover. Or yes, yes. Or, or somewhere dry to put his sleeping bag. <laughs> so where was the sailfish that was new, near uh, Beulah Dilla? Um, I've forgotten hmm. the name of the town, but you know, if... Um, you go the Buller Dealer Bypass now, and you go round the mountain, uh, and the next town up is where there's about two, two big service stations. And if you're coming in from the Sydney side, um, so if you've gone over the old road, over the Buller Wheeler Bends, and you drop down, you, you come off the bends, the first town you come to after Buller Dealer heading north, um, and there's, I think there's a fish and chip shop and a cafe on the left-hand side and a couple of big service stations on the right. And it's, it was in one of those fish and ship cafe places on the left. So if you're up that way and you have a look and it's still there, say, hey, how much for the hull? <laughs> yeah, I, I keep seeing um, VJs around, um, <laughs> around Sydney in yeah. cafes and fish and ship shops and, and those sort of things. The VJs have also, <laughs> they seem to have fluctuated. There seems a, a a lot of historical interest and um, they set up a website and in fact they helped me learn how to do WordPress, the guys that were running the VJ website and they'd, I think they'd modernised the rig and they'd do, done a few other things but it seems to have stalled a bit. Whereas um, I know the scow moths based in Queensland are just going gangbusters. Hmm. Yeah, I guess the other question there is um, the demographics. That as, as you said, um, you know, it's interesting actually, we said you needed people with a 20 year old energy. And, yeah. um, and that's relevant, I guess, like from my point of view, from the mirrors, because that's, yes. that's where my class is, but also for the Raiders, where we also have like a, an aging demographic or yeah. at least a three quarter aged um, <laughs> demographic. Um, so do you think that the 20 year olds are the important thing to get to, for, for growth and, and continuing things on? I, th I think you, well, I hope that there's gonna be a way to, to attract the interest of, 
of young people back into or pardon me, ordinary sailing, not you have to go and do this and be a feeder for an Olympic class, but you can sail for the pleasure of sailing. Um, I think it took me a lot of years to realise that when I went sailing, I went racing because that was what was on. But for me, it's the sailing that's important and not the racing. I can go out and potter around Narrabeen Lakes or, you know, somewhere in the corner of Pittwater or down in a corner of uh, Lake Macquarie and be as happy as a clam. Um, it's being on the water and it's sailing and it's, there must be a lot of people that mm. that appeal is, is true to, but there's no obvious path to say, mm. come on out and go sailing. Mm. And I think if we can do that, if we can find a way to make that connection, then that's, where your your next generation will come through to keep an interest in just messing about in boats. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's that's interesting because that, that's largely what this group is. It's mostly mature people who who want to go sailing, and yeah. um, and I guess the the racing pathway sort of starts out at five or something, yeah. and then goes up to around 15, 16, and then the good ones stay on the elite pathway, and and the other ones drop out. Yeah, and then. People sort and of reappear when they're 50 or something. And, and they're the ones that you, it would be great to, to, to work out a way to, to say to the ones that aren't doing the elite pathway that you don't have to stop sailing. You know, sailing's still good. Um, but I'm not quite sure how, what, uh, how we do that, but that would be a great thing to be able to do to, to, keep, to take into those people. Any others or any other questions? Uh, yeah, I guess I have one just on the rig. I'll probably see it when I look at the website. But is is it a uh, stayed rig or yes. an yeah? So the, the mast is mounted on the deck um, with four stay, two side stays. Uh, the fancy the, the fancier rigs basically to tune it and to get more performance out will have uh, diamonds. Uh, set up as well, or jumper struts, or something to adjust stiffness in the mast. But yeah, it's stayed rig. Right. And it's newer than the older design where you had hiking boards and things like that. Oh, yeah. You're able to. And the one thing I did notice coming back after a, a 30 year layoff um, was that the gunnels were much, much harder than they were when I was younger. <laughs> and uh, I've decided that the single greatest invention of all time is padded sailing shorts. I think the wheel is irrelevant. The wheel is just like, it'll never last. But padded sailing shorts are forever. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. I guess that's one way you could make the boat more cruiser friendly too, is if you put a, like a large hatch in the, in the deck somewhere so you could put some gear within the hull maybe as a as an option do you think I, i'm trying to think of where because it's so shallow because it's um it's a it's a shallow shallow v and at the deepest point that hull's only nine inches deep so um, you're talking what 250 mil roughly yeah yeah you could get small you know camping gear into an area like that if you know you had a maybe a, a small hatch yeah, maybe around the centerboard case. Yeah, because um, <laughs> sorry, Greg. There's there's a guy um did the race to Alaska on a stand up paddleboard. Oh, really? With, with just a little roll of stuff um sort of strapped on in front of him. So he did the whole thing from Port Port Townsend or whatever right up to God. right up through the inside passage. Yeah, so. It's not something I want to emulate, but um, you know. In that case, possible. I revise. I revise my previous. It's a perfect raid raid boat. <laughs> Probably, <yeah. laughs> it's got much more room than a stand up paddle board. Yeah. yeah. Wow, I hadn't heard that. That's yeah. wow. Yeah. yeah. I've heard some horror stories about that. It's hard work. <laughs> that one. Yeah. 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 Hmm. Yeah. Right. All right. Well. I hope I've entertained you. I hope I haven't yes, heard you legless. Yeah, very interesting. Thank you. All right. Um, yeah.
All right. Thank you very much, Greg. And well, um, and of course, when you get up to Sydney, let us know. And yeah, especially absolutely. if you're going to launch this viola on on the lake. Um, yeah, on Wentworth Falls Lake. Fall. I will. I'll, I'll make run it. Yeah, yeah, let us know. Yeah, for sure. Well, you'll be able to walk there. You're laughing. <laughs> yeah, uh, five minutes, two minute drive. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. All right. Thank you all very much for the chance to talk about the sailfish and to talk about Jack. Very good. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. Thank Thanks. you all. Take care. Bye. Bye.